Axioms of Nonviolence by Lanzo del Vasta. Peace is a strong word. It has the same root as pact, and presupposes agreement confirmed by sworn faith and the law. It has the same root as pay, pacer means to appease, and so implies measured compensation. It is an act, an act that costs an effort. It belongs to the same family as compact, and implies solidi solidity and coherence. This simple consideration of the meaning of words reveals the oneness of peace with justice, which is stability, balance, and law. Everyone knows that injustice makes peace impossible, for injustice is a state of violence and disorder which cannot and must not be maintained. It asserts itself through violence, holds sway through violence, and leads to the violence of revolt, which shows that if justice is the reason for peace, it, ha it is at the same time the cause of revolution and war. Acts that always draw their justification from the defense or conquest of rights and the abolition of injustice. But we started off from justice as the foundation of peace, and here we come to justice as the cause of all conflict. Are there two justices then? Yes, the true and the false. The true, which is one as truth is one, true justice is at one with truth. It is above everything, in everything, inscribed in the order of things, exists by itself, and is God. False justice is double and contradictory, and, like mental aberration, engenders illusion and idols. Some men cling to these phantoms more tenaciously than to reality, and so are tormented and torn asunder and hurled against each other in the perpetual war called history. Let no one say of justice what is commonly said of truth, that it is inaccessible. Say, rather, that it is inevitable, obvious as light to the eye, and all errors, error claims its support. How does true justice lapse into false? By means of these three arguments. 1. That we have the right to render evil for evil, and to call the evil rendered true and just. 2. That the end justifies the means, and good ends justify bad means. 3. That reason, agreement, and consent do not suffice to maintain justice, and that it is just to have recourse to fear, compulsion, and force, not only in exceptional cases, but by means of permanent institutions. These three arguments are tenets of faith for the common man, for the good as well as for the evil. They are never called into doubt, never discussed, and on them people base their civil laws and rules of behavior. It has seldom been noticed that they are self-contradictory and can only lead to endless conflict. Therefore, justice and truth require us to disentangle ourselves from these arguments and their consequences. We must free ourselves from them under penalty of death. For the fact is that if today we cannot find other means of solving human conflict, we are all condemned to die. The good news that must be announced in our time is that these means have been found. They are the arms of justice or active revolutionary nonviolence. The nonviolent can be distinguished by their refusal of the three arguments everyone repeats in order to justify violence. Nonviolence says, 1. No, evil is not corrected or arrested by an equal evil, but doubled, and to have recourse to it is to become a link in the chain of evil. 2. No. The end does not justify the means. Evil means spoil the best causes. If the end is just, the means must be just also. No. Fear, compulsion, and force can never establish justice, any more than they can teach us truth. They can only twist conscience. Now, the writing, the writing of conscience is what is called justice.
The nonviolent directly adhere to, to and act from the justice that is one, universal, and as simple as two and two make four. Hunger and thirst for justice are what make them act. They are servants of justice and do not make justice their servant, so as to justify acts dictated by the motives mentioned earlier or reactions dictated by the adversary's attitude. That is why Gandhi names direct nonviolent action satyagraha, that is to say, an act of fidelity to truth. The victory of the violent and nonviolent Sikh is to convince the enemy and bring about a change of heart, Con to convert him by fighting him, and, in the end, make a friend of him. Is the thing possible? How can it be done? Who has ever done it? In what circumstance, and with what results? I shall not answer here. Whole books have been written on the subject. The first thing to learn and understand it, what it is. The second, to try it out for oneself. But it cannot be learned like arithmetic or grammar. Learning and understanding nonviolence are done from within. So the first steps are self-recollection, -rec reflection on the principles, and conversion. That is to say, turning back against the common current. For if the purpose of your action is to make the adversary change his mind without forcing him to, how can you do so unless you yourself are converted? If the purpose is to wrest the enemy from his hatred and his evil by touching his conscience, how can you do so if you have not freed yourself from hatred, evil, and lack of conscience? You, mu you want to bring peace into the world, which is very generous of you. Peace to the uttermost ends of the earth, for you are great-hearted. But do you know how to bring peace into your own house? Is there peace in your heart? Can one give what one does not possess? As for justice, can you establish it between yourself and others, even those who are strangers and hostile to you, if you cannot succeed with your nearest and dearest? And what is more, if you cannot establish it between you, you and yourself? But do not jump on the discouraging conclusion that in order to enter nonviolent combat, one must be a saint, a wise man, or perfect. This form of combat is for one and for all, and we can enter it as we are, with our indignities, and all the better if we are fully conscious of them. But we should know that in principle, if not in fact, we must prepare ourselves as for all struggle. Here, however, preparation must be inward. On the other hand, the struggle itself and the tribulations it involves are exercises that will help our transformation, and self-mastery is a pledge of victory over evil. Peace and justice are harmonious adjustment which does not come about by itself, but is the fruit of effort and work upon oneself, before and during confrontation. That is why Vinoba says, the training ground for nonviolence is a man's heart. But drill is not enough, nor courage, nor reason. There must also be music and a sense of harmony. Let us proceed to the other tenets of every man's faith. 3. All violence, including murder, becomes lawful in the case of self-defense. Another argument that no one calls in doubt. Do you? Yes. Because self-defense is legitimate, a right, and a duty, but murder, which is offense, not defense, is not. Therefore, one should not speak of legitimate defense, but of justified offense, which is self-contradictory. I have no more right to take someone's life in order to defend mine than I have to take his wife in order to ensure my own happiness. Let it be called nature or animal defense. It is of capital importance not to drag the law into this matter.
For if we consider legitimate the exceptional case where one can see no other means of staving off aggression than killing, we shall build upon it a whole system of legislation and institutions whose sole office will be to prepare and perpetuate murder. And that is what we have done. The army, the police, and criminal law are that and nothing else. Defense will no longer be natural and for that reason excusable. It will be premeditated and systematic crime, and there will no longer be any moral restraint or limit to killing and cruelty. 4. Murder is not only permissible, but a duty when common welfare requires it. Now the common welfare in question is not the welfare at all. It is the welfare of a limited group, even if it includes millions of people. The number involved makes no difference. Common welfare cannot be achieved at anyone's expense. Common welfare is justice and charity toward every human being. 5. Technology, economy, and politics are morally neutral. They obey their own natural laws. Here is how men build the gigantic machinery in which they are caught and crushed. That efficiency is good and always necessary for doing something goes without saying but it is senseless to attribute value to it in itself. If efficiency lies in doing evil, then the better it is, the worse it is. 6. Justice is established order. This seventh argument, unlike those that have gone before, is not accepted by everyone. There is no regime which does not have its rebels, but the conviction of the greater number is sure that the ordinary citizen is ready to kill and die through obedience to law and power. Now the law fixes morals. Morals are the effect of a certain balance of force between tribes and classes, hard-won pacts which make possible civil life and work in common. By the standards of absolute justice, the law always has lamentable shortcomings, in addition to which holders of power commit errors and abuses, all of which is coded over by habit and ignorance. But should the balance or power shift, conscience awake, and there ensures revolt, which results in the creation of other states of injustice. There must therefore always be a law to correct the law, and the law is constantly having to be amended and adjusted, as in liberal regimes. But liberal regimes are unstable and continually shaken by rivalry, so that governments have to do more to stay in power than go to govern. Nevertheless, they still have enough strength to abuse their power, and the people, enough passion and blindness to abuse their right of opposition. The liberal regime is no doubt more humane than others, but criticism by the opposition is less pure because it requires less courage. Legal and licit means exist of denouncing injustice in the press and raising questions in Parliament, but the rich, the powerful, and the intriguers remain masters of the game. That is why one must have no fear of resorting to direct nonviolent action if necessary, of breaking the law openly, of seeking legal punishment and undertaking fasts and other sacrifices, so that justice, which is above all law, may dawn in men's consciences. This does not mean that direct nonviolent action is impossible in non-liberal regimes. To be sure, it is more difficult and victory less certain. But whoever does not attempt it is at a relatively stage deserves to fall into bondage and undergo dictatorship. The fact is that in order to do, one must first be, and that has been our endeavor. We do not regard spiritual preparation as a means, but as something intrinsically more important than our outer demonstration or victory. Bringing man face to face with God and face to face with himself is what matters and is desirable for its own sake. When the tree of life has been found again, our acts will fall from it like ripe fruit full of savor. Much more than going into the street 
distributing tracts, speaking to crowds, knocking on doors, leading walks and campaigns, invading bomb factories, undertaking public fasts, braving the police, being beaten and jailed, all of which is good on occasion and which we gladly do. The most efficient action and the most significant testimony in favor of nonviolence and truth is living. Living a life that is one, where everything goes in the same sense, from prayer and meditation to laboring for our daily bread, from the teaching of the doctrine to the making of manure, from cooking to singing and dancing around the fire, living a life in which there is no violence or unfairness, nor illegal unfairness. What matters is to show that such a life is possible, and even not more difficult than a life of gain, nor more unpleasant than a life of pleasure, nor less natural than an ordinary life. What matters is to find the nonviolent answer to all the questions man is faced with today, as at all epochs, to formulate the answer clearly and to do our utmost to carry it into effect. What matters is to discover whether there is such a thing as a nonviolent economy, free of all forms of pressure and closed to all forms of unfairness, whether there is such a thing as nonviolent authority, independent of force and carrying no privileges, whether there is such a thing as nonviolent justice, justice without punishment, and punishment without violence. Such things as nonviolent farming, nonviolent medicine, nonviolent psychiatry, nonviolent diet. And to begin with, what matters is to make sure that all violence, even of speech, even of thought, even hidden and disguised, has been weeded out of our religious life. From Warriors of Peace on the Techniques of Nonviolence. Knopf, New York, 1974. Lanzo del Vasto is the founder of Community del Larch in Roque Ronde, France, a community based on the principles of manual work, interior search, community sharing, and engagement for peace and justice based on Gandhian principles.